Last day we did the first example, right? How to create a kinematics equation and then equate them to the positions and then we saw that really Mathematica is not going to help as much in solving those systems. They, they are kind of big and very non-linear. So today we will just do some more examples. It will be a short class probably. And then next week I would like to work on on, on Lua and being able to define those so see if in, and what we will do from now on is we'll start doing you know practical examples so you guys will be doing designs and then you know once you encounter a problem or an issue then we will see that issue you know how it can be solved what's the theory associated to that all right so we'll we'll start you know enough theory for right now we'll start designing okay thank you so much <laughs> i knew you would like all right so we are just going to do today just more examples examples of design equations and what i would like to do is to type this with the uh, graph theory okay so we will uh, first create the graph for our structure for our topology and and then we will do the the, the equation so we did the 2r right spatial 2r 2r Let's do another linear. Uh, oh, the problem with r tricks is we can only solve revolute joints. Um, well, that's something we need to fix soon. So let's do the next example. Let's just say example two. Which one do you guys want to do? The three r, the three, the four r, the five r. They are all, it's just a serial chain. Let's do the 4R, for instance. Yeah? Okay. 4R. So we are talking here about this kind of system. You have a revolute joint, the first one. And we don't, of course, we don't know where these joints are. A second one. A third one. And a fourth one. And then an end effector. S1, S2, S3, S4. So from now on, you, you know, the course will be driven by your questions and hopefully I'll be able to answer them. Okay, so we will try something and you may say, okay, why are we doing this? Or I'm getting this result, how can we solve this, okay? So this is the topology that we want to dimension and we don't, when we don't know is what we don't know is where are these axes what's the distance between them and so on for a given task so first thing let's let's just do the topology let's just do the graph okay remember we did a seminar about this we haven't covered this in class uh, I thought that you know we didn't have enough time I remember last semester when we taught the the graph spinner manipulation we spent probably three weeks or, or maybe a month talking about graph theory so so remember links are the vertices joints are the edges of the graph and we will always have a root which is the ground link and we will always have an at least one end effector which is the you know, the end effector link right so we start with the root uh, with the root <laughs> this is the ground it's a vertex and then we have between the ground and this uh, link we have joint one, and this is a revolute joint. And here we indicate this is the ground, right? Here we have this link. So this point is this link. And this is linked to this through this R2, right? So it's another R. And here is this link. Now this is linked to the next one through this other R. And then we have the last R that links to the end effector which we mark with a square. So this is the graph of the Howard linkage.
So why don't we do those matrices? Some of those. And uh, there are only a couple that, are, that we care about in order to do the synthesis. One is the incidence matrix and the other is the, the path and the vector path matrix. Okay. Now you take out your notes, you don't have your notes, right? Okay, so let's just do incidence. Matrix B, edge, vertex. Okay. Uh, yeah. So B, I, G, A, one, if vertex i connected to edge i connected to edge j and then zero otherwise right all right so edges oh we should give names to them right so uh, should we name them here so the the, the the edges are already named because we have S1, S2, S3, S4, right? So we have 1, 2, 3, 4. And then the vertices, I'm not sure, should we put a 0? Let's just put a 1. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, okay? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. All right. Okay, give me the numbers here. So vertex one is connected to H one. This is one, okay. Yes, right? And it's the it's the, uh, the only one that it's connected to, right? So zero 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 zero. Vertex two is connected to one and to two. Vect vertex three is connected to two and three. Vertex 4 is connected to 3 and 4. And vertex 5 is just connected to 5. All right. So here we have our incidence matrix. And then we have the path matrix. Let me just put these ones. But in this case, we, we you know the path matrix is when uh, if you, you take every every vertex and you see you know uh, all, all all the ones that you go through to arrive to that through your path. But for this one, we only care about we will take what we call the end effector path matrix. So the only vertex we will care about is about the end effector or end effectors. So we are going to see how many you go through to go in this case because it's a serial chain. It will be all of them. Right. And I'm going to call it T and the vector. And the vector. And the vector. Okay. So then you have your vertex. And the only vertex that is that we care about is five, so it will be just one. It's the only end vector we have, and here we have the edges. And to go to vertex five, you go through one, two, three, four, so one, 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 one. If you go through a, a certain edge, then it's a one. One, one, one. Okay, this is the, the number of the vertex. Okay. So it will be the end effector path matrix. Does that make sense? If we had one with several end effectors, some of the joints won't go to that particular end effector. Then we'll have a, so we have here as many columns as end effectors we have. Okay. As many columns as end effectors. Okay. This these are our initial This one? The path matrix. Yeah, so the the, the, the end effector path matrix is uh, you select a, a, an end effector and you look how many joints are included in the path from the root to that end effector. I forgot to say it's from the root. So for instance, in this case, you know from the root, one, two, three, four, right? To the end effector, you go through all the edges. 
Okay, one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Oh, sorry, I, 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 I did one extra. <laughs> right? Sorry. Oh. <laughs> sorry. Okay. So one, two, three, four. So it's, if you have a one, that means you pass through that uh, edge to go from the root to the end effector. But for instance, if you have a, a robotic hand, right? So you have this kind of situation, right? And now you have uh, one end effector, another one, and maybe another one. So this will be end effector. You know, one, two, three, four, five six, seven, eight. So then you will have three columns. One, four, five. Five, one, four, six, one, four, eight. And then you will look to go to five from the root. And we always have only one root because there is only one ground. Anything connected to the ground is the same ground, right? So you have passed through, you know, H1, and they are not named, but let's say E1, E2, E3, E4, E5, E6, E7, right? So you pass through H1, 2, 3, and 4. 1, 2, 3, and 4. Then to go to the second, you go through 1, 2, and 5, right? So 1, 2, 5. And then to go to this one, you go through 1, 2, 6, and 7, right? 1, 2, six and seven. So that will be the end defector path matrix for a case like this. And you know in this case it's it's obvious but in this case it becomes important to do the counting. That's why we are doing all this. So it's not let me just extend it a little bit so that you can see that. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. There are two paths to end effector. So there is one uh, if there is more than one path to the end effector, and that's a very good question, for for synthesis purposes we will do in the graph what we call the, the reduction. And we will eliminate the loops. And we will leave everything as a single path. And that's, uh, in this example, we won't talk about it. But we will do another example with loops. And we will see how, for synthesis purposes, you eliminate all the loops. So there is only one path. There is always one path only between uh, root and end effector. And it's a very interesting topic. So, OK. So these are our matrices, but this is before we do anything with this graph. So this is the original graph. The first thing we do when we do synthesis, we do the compact graph. In the compact graph, what we do is we eliminate all serial chains. So all uh, vertices um, of degree 2, binary vertices, OK? Eliminate binary vertices. Binary means how many edges are incident on that on that vertex. So in our case, and we are just going to do our case here. Maybe I'll do it in the next page. Okay, eliminate binary. Let me just go back to our example. One, oh, <laughs> one ground, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Okay. So this is our original four R, right? Now, this vertex has only one edge incident to it, right? And this one has only one. These two, these three have two, right? Each. So we can eliminate those, and we, when we compactify the graph, we will end up with something like this. And we will say here we have 1, 2, 3, 4, R. We will mark this just for us to know. Okay. So it's just a single. So every, every serial chain in your graph becomes just an edge. And we don't need to indicate the end effector anymore because you know if it's at the end it's an end effector because we indicate the root. Okay. So this is our compacted graph for the four R. Let me just show you another example so because this is like why are we doing this, right? Let me just put a just an arbitrary graph, see if we can <laughs> hopefully that will work. Ah, 
that's too. Okay. All right. So here we have this graph. Oh, we are going to mark. This has a lot of end effectors. So now we have to identify the binary links and just substitute those. So here we have one binary link. This one is not binary. It has one, two, three, four edges connected to it. Okay. This is not binary, this is ternary, this is ternary. Here is another binary and two binary here. So we can pass this to this has to stay the same because it's not binary and then we have one here. Here we can eliminate one. So this, for instance, if these are all revolute joints, this could be R, R. And we have to indicate the R because we have different types of joints. So it could be here, R, P, S, okay. Here we can have a 2R, 2R, okay. Now we have another one here and here we have another 2R. And here we have another one, and here we have one, two, three R, three R, and now we have two more. Okay, so it's the compacted graph. We just eliminate all the serial parts, make the, of that just one single edge, and then we see all the ones in which we have several branches uh, steaming out of a point. And if it uh, has a loop? If, so this, see, this is just compacting. So this eliminates the serial chains. And uh, if it has a loop, you could do the same thing. So for instance, let me just, let's just comp imagine this one, right? Like this would be like the four bar linkage, right? Yeah, two and two, right? To the, to the end effector. So you, w the way you compact it is just put two, yeah. You know, you have one here, and then you have another one here, right? This two R and two R. Exactly, that's the idea. The idea is that it will let you identify the loops easily. That's one of the ideas of compacting. So you get rid of everything that is not loops or, or, or branching, and that allows you to identify the loops and the branches easily. Now, the second step that we do for, for synthesis is what we call the, redu the reduction. And that's something that I was going to say we invented, but I should say Edgar invented. So I'm not sure if it's used also in, in different areas, but basically what we do is we, we eliminate the, the loops. Eliminate loops. And this is just for the synthesis, I mean, from a synthesis point of view, for synthesis. So this is really changing your, your topology, what we do here. And uh, what we do is we look at what is the task that one of the branches can accomplish, what is the task that the other branch can accomplish, and then we keep the most restrictive one. Once we have solved for the more restrictive, we can always solve for the other one, which will have you know extra variables. So when you have a loop in a in a mechanism, either so imagine a parallel robot. I just take you know, uh, you know yeah. Usually, what you have is you have the same topology in each of the legs, right? But that doesn't have to be the case always. So if you have the same topology in each of the legs, like in this case of this parallel robot, you can just solve for one of the legs and eliminate the other ones from a kinematic synthesis point of view. It's the, it's the same. And if you don't believe that, raise your hand and say, I don't believe that. Why is that? Okay? Do you believe that? You don't believe that. Of course. Why is that? Well, let me show you why is that. But let me finish the reasoning and then we'll show why is that. So if all the legs are the same, you eliminate the other legs, solve for this, and then add the, add the extra legs at the end. Okay? That's for, for. If one leg is more restrictive than the other, that's the one that is going to 
restrict how big your task can be. So you can design for that, and the other legs will have extra freedom there. You can always add them later to, to accomplish that task. So we kind of do the reduction, and then after we have done the synthesis, we build the link, the whole parallel linkage again. That's the idea. And we can do some examples once this is well worked out. But why is that that when you have the same legs, you can use just simply one leg? Well, let me just state the equations for this. Imagine that we want to solve for this linkage, or just a general. Let me just put, you know, you have this, these are joints, and they all go through us through us. Same platform, and it may have n joints, uh, I mean, n legs, okay? And they are all the same. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, okay? So these are connected to the ground. And this is our this is our end effector, and here is the, po the set of positions we want to reach. So we can write the forward kinematics for leg one, right? Or leg A. And you know, forward kinematics of relative displacements, this part over here disappears, kind of, you know, you just, because it's constant. And you know, for, for leg A, you'll have, you know, same as we do, S1 of theta one, A, S, N, A of theta N. These are all unknown, right? Equal to the position we want. P, I, 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 P, one, I, right? So this is, you know, equating the displacement of one leg to this. But if they all have the same structure, if you put this leg also has to hit here, you are putting the same system of equations. There's no change. So you are actually repeating your equations three times which, you know, it, they, are, they are the same equations. They are not only dependent, they are exactly the same, okay? So for each leg, you end up with the same equations. The way this is solved, I mean, you could put those equations and then maybe put some constraints between them. Okay, I want this to be at a distance from this. Then you are making a problem a little bit simpler. You are restricting the, the whole set of solutions. So leg B, same because the thetas are, the S's, S are unknowns and the thetas are unknown. So it will have the exact same same set of equations. Let's see, same. So what we do is we solve one, and that will give us many solutions, and each solution corresponds to one of the legs. Okay? I think we'll have to do an example. I see exact skeptic faces around. Solve one. Every solution is a leg. Is a leg. Again, if you want to impose a particular geometry, like for instance some symmetry, then you can write all three and then impose some conditions between them. But that's a more restricted problem. That's not the most general problem. If you are talking about, you know, without any restriction where these legs will be for a task, then one set is enough. In fact, if you put more sets, you're not adding anything. We'll do one example. But this all came to see that the reduction is either take one of the identical legs or just take the most restrictive leg for you know, completing the task and then back calculate the other legs once you are done. That's the reduction. So basically, we eliminate the loops and we keep just one branch always. Hmm, I still see it that you are not very convinced. <laughs> All right, so basically this was to say, okay, after the comp compacting and reducing, we get a graph that looks like this, okay? When, or like this, oh, sorry, or like this. It won't have any loop and it won't have any binary uh, vertis, vertex. Okay. So uh, the final product is a compacted and reduced graph. Okay. And in this case, we are not going to use it for this simple example, but later, in order to calculate how many positions we need, we'll use those matrices. We will do matrix calculations. 
for R. Remember that in order to define our, our set of, of, of positions for our task, we need to count how many equations can we create for this, how many unknowns we have, equate those and get a solution, right? And uh, R equal 4 in this case. And I never remember the formula. So let me just state it again. 6 m minus 1. We don't have extra constraints. We have 4 times 4, right? 16. Structural variables plus 4 m minus 1. Hopefully. So this is 2m equal 22 minus 4. 18 m equal 9 finite positions if you don't remember what this formula was about we can talk about it but this is the maximum you can define because we cannot create more equations to solve for more than that okay so now we can define nine positions however you want and then solve for the 4r and in order to solve for the 4R, we need to create the forward kinematics equations and equate those to the positions. So for M equal 9 positions, and then we take 1 as take one as reference, and the reference again is arbitrary, so you could take 4 if you want and then consider p sub 1i i equal 2 to 9 okay and now create create forward kinematics equations plus equate so now from now on the process is very systematic you don't have much to do right so the forward kinematics equations of a serial for revolute uh, joint chain will be as S1, the first revolute joint theta 1 for position i or 1i, S2 of theta 2 for position i. We multiply this. Remember, those are the screw displacements about the joints at the reference configuration. So you move from the reference configuration, start with the last joint, then the previous one, and so on. S4 theta 4 sub i equal to p1 i i equal to to 9 these are our equations remember these are dual quaternion so even though some of the equations are dependent you will have 8 times 8 right number of equations eight times eight 64, right? So 64 equations, what's the degree of this equation? So you are multiplying the, the structural, the Plucker coordinates of the lines are here linear, right? And now you are multiplying times this, times this, times this, so it's going to be, like the Plucker coordinates are going to be in the fourth order in each equation, right, maybe? And then you have the cosines of, and the sines of the angles, which are also variables. So the, the degree is quite high. We can, we can look at that now in of a high degree degree but really we want to solve for only the Plucker coordinates of the line that's what gives us our robot which is 4 times 6 and we want Twenty-four uh, parameters out of this. We get many more because we also get the, the joint variables, but these are not the ones that we want. And even these are not all, all independent, right? There are four independent for each joint, so it's sixteen really. What what we need? If we have sixteen, then we have all the information that we want. Anyway, let's, let's go to Mathematica and, and just multiply these equations for you to see how big they become. Okay, that's basically, this is the 
part where you get scared about how big these are. All right, I'm going to start downloading that. Any questions about this? So desktop matrix, n equal nine instead of three, we have calculated that. And, okay, these are our nine positions. And in this function, the, the one that makes the, the displacement, that's limited, I think it's from minus four to four. You can go to matrix.m and change that or just create another function if you want bigger positions, if that doesn't fit your, your task, okay. All right, so let me just do this quickly where we plot the positions. And you will generate your own positions, which is good. Okay. <laughs> Maybe our, our range is too small, right? Plot range minus 20. Okay, where are our lines? Oh, this was just one. Like why do we see only one position? Here they are. Okay. So these are the nine. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. This one is a little bit cut, so let me just put a little bit bigger interval. Okay. All right. Now we have all the positions inside. All right. And then this calculates the relative position, so I'm just going to run it fast. Okay, now we have to create the forward kinematics for the RRRR robot. Now, uh, what is the string right now? This one? Yeah. So these are the these are the relative positions. These are the relative the transformations from the first one, which we had not identified here, and, and you know, it's one of these is the first one, and we don't know why which one right now. We can, we can plot it separately and then see which one it is. But now, in the second plot is from that. Imagine this is the first position, so it will be the displacement from here to here, from there to there, from there to there, and all expressed in the fixed frame, okay? Mm -hmm. So these frames that don't have, you know, an immediate physical meaning as the others could have, which was, you know, attached to the end effectors. These ones are just a relative displacement. Mm. So there's no point in plotting this one, basically. So I'm going to just, I'm going to just leave the RR, we don't have to kill it, and then just put the RRRR after that. Okay, so now RRRR, this will be four. RRRR RR robot, and then we need to just, little bit of manual work, yes, this is the thing we can automatize, but maybe not, not right now. You can play with the strings and create your access automatically. Oh, yeah, yeah, let me just, I'll, I'll put the zoom in. Let me finish with the three, because if not then, okay, so this, I'm just creating four axes. So one, two, three, four. All right, so this will be our unknown that we want to solve for, basically. All the rest is extra. All right, so here are the four axes, and this was an extra command that we don't need here. Okay, so now we have to make four dual quaternions which will correspond to the screw displacements about this axis. Okay, so QS1, QS2, QS3, and we put a theta 3 here, and then QS4. And, of course, we also have to change the S that we use. 
Okay. So each each of these is exactly the same as, as the other ones. So these are just revolut joints, so just rotations about the axis. And now we just need to multiply all these four together. We get the forward kinematics of relative displacements of the chain. That's what we get. Oh, we then execute this one. <laughs> this one. You can see because they are blue. So, so forward kinematics for relative displacements. Now we have to do several quad mold, right? So we have quad mold. Someday I'll need to hire somebody to fix this. <laughs> QS3 and then quad mold. I know you can do it in Mathematica, it's pretty powerful. QS4. Okay, so now we have multiplying QS1, QS2, QS3, QS4. The order matters, not how you associate them. You can associate them however you want, but you cannot uh, switch the, you cannot commute the, the operands. And then we had to multiply this. And I'm going to just execute this line because it's going to take a while. While while you guys work on and if you have any command that doesn't work, let me know as as Abhijit did. Just thinking, I think I'm going to abort the evaluation. And if something is running for a very long time, you can always abort the evaluation, and I'm going to take the collect. Maybe I'll leave the collect, but I'll... Yeah, just a second, let me just... Okay, oh, there it is. A very large output was generated. Here is a sample of it, you can show more. You can show the full out output. And let me just run it through one generation. This is all our equations. And you know, it's... It's are kind of big, okay. Uh, yes. Before Mathematica existed, we have to... Nobody solved these problems <laughs> before. Those were too complicated, that's why. I you know they are unsolved because of this complexity, that's why. I mean, conceptually they are not, you know, once, you, or maybe they are, but you know, once you have your, your way of stating the equations, it's, it's easy, right? But uh, you, before computer, you know, before Mathematica, you would never develop this by hand. It's just too much, you know. You could leave it indicated and then try to do something with it, but... Um, so we can look... I mean, just make it smaller for a, for a moment. Let me just make it 50%. Just for you to see the equation, okay? So look at this. These are our design equations. Start here, and they go, 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 and they go. So this is the system of equations we need to solve up to here. It's kind of huge, okay? But these are not the most efficient equations, okay? These are the ones that are easy to 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 create. That's what happens. Okay. So look at the. For instance, let's take a term. Let me see, let me take a big term to see the, the degree of each equation. Remember, there are 64 uh, equations, each of them, let me see, six, three, four. let's take this one. So we have one, two, three, four variables multiplying one, two, three, four angles. So this is the FKA. Oh, we haven't equated that too. These are just the forward kinematics. Now we have to equate the forward kinematics to the positions we want. And then because the theta will be different for each position, we have to change that. But if we want to do that by hand, it's kind of... Uh, so now you should put, you know, theta 3, 1, theta 4, 1, theta 3, 2, 3, and then up to 9, you know, or up to, up to 8, you know, we have 8. Uh, so we may not want to do that. And let me just... Uh, 3, 1, Four one. So this is one set. This is the set of angles for one position, for the first relative position. And then you have to do that for each one. So two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Which is a pain to do it like this, so we won't do it, or maybe I will. 
we maybe next day I'll, I'll upload a file that does that automatically it just takes the string and creates a table and adds the number okay so I'm, I'm just going to put here keep working on it so that you know that this is not right <laughs> ah. no if we want to create the equations but then we have to for three four two four three four 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 ah should have brought that today three five four five two six three six four six seven it's almost there so let's just get done with it so this you don't do it manually but you do it, okay. And now we just equate that, and now we have to put the same theta two goes to the thetas, and theta th four, theta three, and theta four, right? So you will have this, uh, I'll upload this, but theta three will be the third one, and theta four will be the fourth one. And now we equate to the poses. So now we are equating the forward kinematics to the poses. I'm not going to show this. I'm just going to put a semicolon so that it doesn't show. Uh, oh, there. I have an extra comma. Another extra comma. I have another extra comma here. All right. There we go. So now in this line we have the design equation. The forward kinematics is that huge monster equated to each of the positions. Okay. And now, say that again. Yeah, this we, 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 we don't want to show it. And this one we don't want to show it either. So I'm going to just put the semicolon so that we don't see it. And we can look at how big are these. And these are uh, 16. And why are these? Oh, ah, N, right? Minus one. This one we had not substituted that. Okay, what did we do here? Uh, hmm. I'm not sure what I did here. Ta -ra -ra, ta -ra -ra. Minus positive five okay why does it need a part five oh f k a why do I have an eye here Okay, I don't know why I had an I there. Maybe that's what the problem was before. Right? You have the forward kinematics equation such that this and you, and then you know that creates an instance for this I, and then you equate that to the poses. So I think that's the right one. I will need to correct that in the. Okay, and now we should have 64 equations. Okay, now it's okay. Hmm. All right, we need to fix that in the previous one. Anyway, it's it's almost time. But now we have this is the set of design equations that you know you will see that our current uh, numerical solver creates internally. So just you know, given the number, the type of joint and the number of joints, it creates these equations, assembles them, and then solves numerically. Uh, in this case, we have the 64 equations. Only in this, let me just write it down: 64, and we said that there were only. 6 times 8, 48 independent, right? And then we had 4 times 6, 24 structural variables, but only 4 times 4, 16 independent structural variables, plus we have 4 times 8, 32 joint variables. So suddenly the joint variables start taking over. Having big sets of joint variables that you don't want, they are useless. 
for design, but you know they are more than the structural variables. When the problem is small, they are manageable. When the problem grows, then they become ugly. But they are still there in the way we create the equation, so no much that we can do. All right. So hopefully next day we will learn how to use the solver and we won't have to create these equations very often ourselves, but it's good for you guys to know how, how they are and how they look. If, if you want, tr you can try to just send them to MATLAB or some other solver that you know and try to run them and see, see what happens, you know, how, how long they take to, to solve, but uh, I wouldn't advise you to do that with big problems. Small problems is okay. Okay, let me fix that. We had a mistake here, right? Here. Okay, I'm going to run this one. So we are, we are done, but I want to run the 2R, because maybe that's what happened, n equal 3. I want to repeat the, the 2R. Uh, the forward kinematics, the theta, the design equations, flatten, length is 16. Okay. Let's see. Now they are solving. We had a um, uh, bug in the two R, so if you if you want you can correct that. When we create the design equations you have to equate the whole forward kinematics to the position. For some reason I had an I there. So now it's trying to solve the two R problem, okay? That's what I'm, I did, I just ran. While it's trying to solve, let me just show you where the mistake was um, here. Uh, 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 uh. We had F K E of I, and you have to take that I out of there. It's the whole forward kinematics equated to the position I. Maybe a while before it does. Anyway. We can we can leave it here.